I'm exceptionally happy to uh, be here this morning to introduce Father Emmanuel Katangale. In February of 2013, I sat in a meeting at Duke University with Chris Rice of the Center for Reconciliation, uh, the institute of which the center is a part of, the Institute for Church Life, was doing an external review at the time. So we were doing site visits to have people tell us what we could do better. And we wanted to hear a bit about the Center for Reconciliation summer programming. In the midst of this interview, the first thing that we heard was a significant lament that Father Emmanuel Katangale had just departed for the University of Notre Dame. So that was so somewhat sad for, for them and it was really a gift for us. After reading through the biographical information regarding uh, Father Katangale, you get a sense of what precisely Duke lost. Father Emmanuel, an associate professor of theology and peace studies, is a Catholic priest of the Archdiocese of Kampala in Uganda. Father Emmanuel received his doctoral training at Catholic University, Leuven, in philosophy. His research focuses on politics and violence in Africa, the theology of reconciliation, and Catholicism in the Global South. Yet simply detailing Father Emmanuel's research interests doesn't give you a sense of his keen and healing theological imagination. Perhaps speaking about the books he's authored will give you a better sense. The Sacrifice of Africa, a political theology for Africa. Mirror to the Church, resurrecting faith after genocide in Rwanda. Reconciling all things, a Christian vision for peace, for justice, peace, and healing. A future for Africa, critical essays in Christian social imagination, to name just a few. But we need to go even further attending to one of these works, quoting from Reconciling All Things, authored by Father Emmanuel and Chris Rice, I quote, shaped by convictions about God, our faith and practice point us to a deeper vocation of hope, offering a vision of what the journey of reconciliation looks like in this world. Where that journey leads, how people who enter that journey are transformed along the way, and how that journey relates to neighbors, strangers, and enemies. Christianity does not exist to motivate people for work within the prevailing visions of reconciliation. Rather, Christianity offers distinct gifts of seeing, speaking about, engaging, and being transformed within the world and its brokenness. I can think of no better guide to offer us a vision of reconciliation at the end of our symposium than Father Emmanuel in his talk this morning, Reconciliation, the Gift of an Invitation into Another World. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for the wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you all for uh, your time this morning, for uh, inviting me, uh, Tim, to speak at this uh, symposium. I'm indeed very, very honored and delighted to be here uh, this morning uh, to share with you uh, something of what I have learned about the journey of reconciliation. And uh, I want, first of all, to say how uh, much I enjoyed the, the dinner and the banquet last evening, uh, the music, uh, the Irish music. And for me, it was uh, an invitation into uh, a new cultural experience. Um, coming from Africa, when I, I had there was a banquet, I was looking forward to drums and uh, all that kind of dancing that we associate with Africa. But this was different, <laughs> and it was beautiful, and I, I loved it. I think it's somehow connected to what I want to say this morning about uh, reconciliation. 
as the, the gift of an invitation into another world. And the kind of gifts that we get, we experience into that other world, gifts that we didn't even know existed. In brief, that's what I think reconciliation is about. And of course, it does involve healing. It does involve our enemies get reconciled or moving on in a new way, in a new future. It does involve many gifts. Part of the challenge of our time when we talk about reconciliation is that reconciliation is an average, ordinary, everyday word that, that is used in English to, to mean many things. In fact, one of the things that I realized uh, as I started together with my colleague, the Center for Reconciliation at Duke University, and as we spoke different places, as we were invited to speak at different uh, audiences, the idea is that people, when they invite you to speak about reconciliation, they're thinking about one specific element, or they're thinking about some specific elements and, and goals and objectives for why they are inviting you. Uh, basically, I have realized that there are three uh, basic um, expectations. And this is a kind of if, a little bit of a caricature, but when people th think about reconciliation, sure, they kind of stand within these three camps. The first camp is the more a kind of um, <coughs> evangelical word. In the evangelical word, reconciliation is required, uh, you know, has achieved uh, a new popularity. And when people talk about reconciliation, they talk about reconciliation ministries. The ministry is in a way that reconcile people, that reconcile enemies, and um, that heal divides. And I have received a number of invitations speaking to uh, evangelical context, a Protestant context. So when they call you to speak about reconciliation, what they really want to you to speak about is, how do you do it? What are the skills? How do you become a reconciler? And I discovered that actually people do have reconciler as one of their business uh, expertise. And so people carry around business cards and reconciler is a title. So what do you do? I'm a reconciler. So if there is brokenness, if there is a, a disagreement and so forth, you can call in those kind of people to reconcile, to medi mediate. So people who are standing within that what usually are calling or looking for a person with expertise on reconciliation skills. How do you do it? And the kind of question that usually follow is, okay, I have this case, uh, my husband did this and this, so how do we get reconciled? Give us some skills of how do you reconcile? That's one category. People looking for specific skills on how to reconcile. Here at Notre Dame, I teach in the Institute for Peace Studies. So in the area of peace studies, the Kroc Institute, in the area of politics, reconciliation is also becoming more and more popular, especially following the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Reconciliation is being discovered within politics that actually reconciliation can help communities move on a new future, especially communities that have been experiencing war, enmity for a long time, communities that have been going through endless cycles of, 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 of violence. How do they come into a new future? Well, there is something like reconciliation, the whole process. And what uh, Desmond Tutu and others stand for in South Africa is that kind of process brought into the political field. So there is a lot of literature out there on the politics of reconciliation. Uh, one of my colleagues at the Peace Institute at the Croc, Dan Philport, has written a beautiful book called Just and Unjust Peace. And within it, 
Reconciliation is a process, a political process that is engaged by diplomats, by heads of state, as a way to heal the past of nations, nations whether nations like um, South Africa, or Rwanda, or Bosnia, where there have been atrocities to move into a new future. A politics of reconciliation. So when I get in invitations to uh, places like the Croc Institute and others who are doing peace studies, what they are really looking for is uh, areas and how is the process of political reconciliation engaged? How do communities that have been experiencing animosity, enmity, uh, move into a new future of life together, similar to what happened in South Africa? Then there is a third group, and again a bit of culture. Uh, this is mostly from a Catholic point of view. We Catholics, when we think about reconciliation, we immediately think about, okay, our relationship with God. How do we get reconciled in our brokenness, in our sinfulness? How does God reconcile us? And usually within that, we immediately think about the sacrament of penance, which is the sacrament of reconciliation. And so people are usually interested in, so what are the ways in which we move into that dynamic in which our relationship with God is restored, is renewed, is made whole, and how we participate in the sacrament of reconciliation. I don't know whether this is uh, what is also at the heart of the, uh, this symposium and the invitation, as the, the invitation letter uh, clearly uh, spelled out to uh, in uh, the expectations of my, my talk. We would like you, Father Emmanuel, to give us a talk on reconciliation, one that might renew the imagination of our guests regarding what it means to participate fully, consciously, and actively in the rite of penance, in the sacrament of reconciliation. So that's another uh, area of this kind of personal, deep personal relationship with God and how that gets uh, restored. My sense is that all these three are part of this rich and complex notion of reconciliation. Reconciliation involves all that and even much more. So even though I know that your interest might be specifically in how do we participate more fully, more meaningfully within the rite of penance, within the sacrament of reconciliation, what I would like to do is kind of to paint the large vision of reconciliation. Uh, so that maybe towards the end we can talk more about what's the role of liturgy and worship? How does worship and liturgy in a way bring us into this dynamic that is called reconciliation, that is so uh, rich and complex that cannot be covered by any one of these three dimensions, but that involves all these three dimensions. So what I want to do is kind of to paint that very broad, if you like, is kind of the bird's eye view image of reconciliation, a kind of 3,000 feet uh, overview of what is reconciliation from a theological point of view, from a Christian point of view. How do we understand reconciliation? And what's then the place of liturgy and worship within this rich dynamic that is called reconciliation? Uh, so to begin, when I think about reconciliation in this broad, very comprehensive uh, notion, a story comes to mind. It is actually uh, my own story. For the, when, for the first time, I traveled in business class. For many of you, of course, this might be an everyday experience, I don't know. But for me, it was a new experience, and I do remember exactly when this happened in the summer of 2010. Uh, my flights to um, Brussels were delayed, and I was going to make a connection to Brussels to Entebbe, Uganda, for, for the summer. As it turned out, and the delay was in New, in New York, as it turned out, I would miss my connection in uh, Brussels, and uh, they said, okay, we'll put you on the next flight. But then, of course, they realized that the flights from Brussels to Uganda don't go every day. I would have to spend three days in Brussels to make my next connection. So by the travel, uh, the 
the person at the front desk uh, was very, very kind. She said, okay, let me see what we can do. So she looked around at different possibilities and found, finally found uh, a new route for me that would put me on a different airline that would take me through London and then finally into Entebbe. So I would be late for like only seven hours. And so she had to reroute me through uh, Heathrow Airport. But for this, she was kind enough to say, we will uh, bump you up to business class for the inconvenience caused. So immediately she gave me uh, a card to go to the lounge in, 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 at JFK. So I went into this lounge. I said, oh my goodness. I, I, I really, honestly, I didn't know that these kind of spaces existed in, in, in airports. For me, my word of airports is the, the busy terminals and, the, <laughs> and all these kind of tired looking passengers kind of wearing their um, overly laden carry-on bags and, and very cheap, well, not cheap, expensive food, <laughs> very expensive food, and to a large extent also tasteless. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm here in this lounge, I say, wow, and they are all the nice amenities, uh, fresh wine, and uh, nice uh, comfortable chairs, uh, and surprisingly, you don't even hear the, these endless announcements. <laughs> and of course they came uh, to call us by name. Mr. Katongole, your flight is ready, please follow me. I said, wow, man, this, <laughs> this is quite, quite, quite interesting. So we go in, of course, we are the first one to board, and all the people are looking at us, and they say, oh my God, where are these people going? And so we sit down, and fresh towels, and so forth, and glasses of champagne. By the time uh, the rest of God's people walk in, we are onto our second glass of champagne, and kind of <laughs> looking pretty re relaxed and <laughs> compared with everybody else. But you know, the best part was in London. The, 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 the lounge in London was, was something, was really something else. It's replete with showers, massage chairs, and the gourmet food. And I, Honestly, as I told you, I never knew that these kind of spaces existed within the world of airports. It was a complete new experience for me. And as I left in a way, kind of after um, an 18 uh, hour journey to Entebbe, I realized how for the first time, I was not tired from flying. I, I was fresh actually. <laughs> and I kept wondering, and said, why don't I do this every day? <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I said, this is where I belong. Why, why, why? <laughs> Why has it taken so long for people to realize that? <laughs> but it was a complete fresh new experience, one that I didn't know existed. Reconciliation is such a notion. It's an invitation into and the gift of a totally, completely new, fresh experience that we may not even know that exists. At least this is what Paul has in mind. You know, reconciliation appears 18 times in the New Testament. The notion of reconciliation. Katalage, katalasso, and it's many the Greek word. But 16 of these are used by Paul. The other two where in the New Testament it appears is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, when you are bringing your gift to the altar and then you realize you have something against your brother, first be reconciled to your brother and then bring your gifts to the altar. And the other one is in Acts of the Apostles uh, when uh, speaking about Moses and how Moses uh, went and saw these uh, two Israelis fighting and he wanted to reconcile them in peace. The rest of the time, 16 times, are uh, used by Paul. So this is a typical Pauline concept. And for Paul, this is a rich term that expresses the whole dynamic of what the gospel is about. Paul is using this notion of reconciliation in a way as a kind of a short term for the gospel, for the good news. 
So what does Paul do with, with the notion? Let, let's, let, let's look at one passage in which, as I said, 16 times Paul uses the notion of reconciliation through his letters. But in this one time in the second letter of the Corinthians, in a very brief passage, he does actually use the word reconciliation five times. That kind of really bring it down to almost the heart of the gospel as Paul understood it. Um, can log in my own. Oh well. Yeah. It's not the lounge. It's, it's, it's not the lounge, yeah, yeah. We are we are back in economic class, yeah? <laughs> well, 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 well I guess what better way to <laughs> to, to, to talk about to uh, reconciliation than to experience the, the word of old habits. Because the passage that I want to uh, draw attention to, uh, oh, uh, Tim, uh, I think it is online. Yeah, maybe if I can log in on my email. I'll have it here in a sec. Oh, you would have it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, the text that I want to uh, draw our attention to is a text of uh, 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Does anyone have a Bible here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm speaking among, among Catholics. So what, what am I? <laughs> this, this is <laughs> Bible. Bible. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do have the text. I do have the text, but I wanted maybe somebody to uh, to head us re read what they have. Uh, yes. So it's uh, it's five. It's seventeen. Uh, 2, 5, 17. But we're going to begin with 16, actually. Okay. From now on, therefore, we regard, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Keep going. Okay. Up to 20. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Thank you. Uh, what, what's your name? Conrad. Where are you from, Conrad? Nova Scotia, Canada. Nova Scotia, Canada. You know, it takes uh, Canadian Catholics to have uh, the Bible, the Bible ready. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, this, 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 this is the major difference. As, as I said, uh, one and a half years ago, that's when I moved from Duke University to, to Notre Dame. But Duke University is basically a Methodist uh, university, and it's in uh, North Carolina, and right. The invitations that I get from uh, Protestant evangelical churches, everybody would of course have their Bible. And so when you say 2 Corinthians 5, 17, they would not only immediately open the Bible, but many of those would already be very familiar with that text. Now, how many of you, whether in your parishes or congregation, have used this text in one context or another? Okay. Again, this is a major difference because many uh, Protestant and evangelical churches, when you speak about 2 Corinthians 5.17, they would immediately know what we are talking about, the text that we are talking about, and about reconciliation. And they would also, the other aspect, that they would immediately jump to the conclusion of it. Therefore, the mission has been given to us, therefore we are ambassadors of reconciliation. The word ambassador will stand out and therefore, we have a mission of reconciliation in the world. Therefore, the question is, okay, how do we do it? What are the skills in which we become ambassadors and so forth? But this is kind of to really jump ahead of the text. 
if you get want to get a sense of what Paul is doing, it is that whole comprehensive notion of reconciliation. You got to read the whole passage, and that whole passage, a number of things stand out. The first uh, thing that stands out is this notion of new creation. If you can read for us that first line 17, verse 17 again. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Good. New creation. Anyone in Christ. So I'm going to identify six elements within this passage that seem to be so crucial to what Paul is doing with that uh, passage. And I think our technical person is also... I'm almost there. Uh, almost you there. said it's online? It's online, yeah. It's, it's not coming up set in, on the computer, but I can find it online. Well, if I can go on my email, I can pull it out. Over. Great. So the first element I want to speak about is a new creation. Uh, if anyone in Christ, there is a new creation. That is how this passage. Uh, what what translation are you using? NRSV. Uh, anybody has a different uh, translation? I want to hear how it is rendered in different translations. That uh, particular passage. Yes. What, how does it go? Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Uh, any other translations? Now, that passage as it is, uh, the way it is translated actually doesn't give you a full sense of what Paul is saying. Definitely the sense that whoever is in Christ is a new creation, and that is a very general, usual translation is very misread, misleading and is wrong. It's not that in the Greek text, it's not that Paul is saying whoever is in Christ, he is or she is a new creation. No. Paul is actually not even saying that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. He's not even saying that within the original Greek translation. Paul is just saying anyone in Christ, new creation. It's, it's, it's like in the way it is kind of punctuated is that there, there, is, there is no verb, it, which, which, which means that what Paul is doing is actually announcing. What Paul is doing actually is proclaiming. Anyone in Christ, new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God. You can almost feel a sense of Paul's excitement in the text if you render it right. Anyone in Christ, New creation, all is gone, the new is here. And that's a subject, that's a subject that Paul is talking about, the new creation. Now, notion of new creation, is this another very typical Pauline term? Paul likes that word new creation and does use it a number of times uh, 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 in, his, in his letters. You got it, my goodness. Yay. Hey! Okay, that's a passage. We already, we already uh, 
at that passage? Anyone requires new creation? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about this new creation. Uh, Paul, Paul loves this term of, 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 of new creation. In fact, when you look at the Paul's letters, the way he uses the term new creation, it is the gospel is about that, the new creation. Anyone in Christ, new creation. And you can almost get into the sense of what Paul is talking about. Okay, there was an old creation. And for us, then it begins to raise the question, what happened to the old creation? And of course, you begin to remember the story of creation. Beautiful, orderly in Genesis, and then sin. And from then, God is reconciling. The second passage that comes up again in, in Paul here. God has been reconciling, trying to, in a way, kind of get back to the creation. So when Paul uses the term new creation, he already he kind of gives in a very brief summary that whole sense of that journey from creation to new creation. New creation as the, the telos, as the goal, as the end toward which everything is directed. The biblical story is directed. God has been doing that. And so for Paul to announce that anyone in Christ, new creation, the old is gone, the new is here. He's already announcing the new creation, that whole journey, the biblical journey that has been going, is here. The old is gone, the new is here. <coughs> Very uh, interesting way for Paul for, 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 for to that. And that's where he brings in this notion of the old is gone. The old is gone, the new is here. He uses the Greek word parakomai. The old is gone, the new is here. Parakomai is pass away. The old has passed away, the new one is here. The old is gone, it's a new one, it's parakomai. And in fact, it is the same word parakomai that Paul uses in the letter to the Colossians when he says, the old man has passed away, and you put on a new man. <coughs> Again, the same, the same notion of passing away. The old is gone, the new is here. It's the same word that he uses again in the letter of the Colossians when he talks about that Christ has taken us from the dominion of darkness and passed us on to the, uh, the dominion of, uh, of Christ, uh, the kingdom of light the kingdom of God's beloved son. What is significant for Paul that this passing away, the parakomai, Paul announces as something real. It has happened. It's not just simply metaphoric that, oh, there's new creation kind of, you know, you have to use that as an, an, an image, an, a metaphor. No, Paul says, it's real. The old is gone, the new is here. Thirdly, all this is from God, the gift. It's not our making, it's not our deserving, it's not even predicted on certain kind of conditions that if we do this and this and this, then God is going to bring into existence the new creation. No, the new creation is here. The old is gone and all this is from God. Now, all these three... <coughs> You, you hear Paul is kind of stating as a matter of fact, he, it's real. He's actually not just stating, he's, he's singing, he's proclaiming, he, he's filled with exhilaration for, for this. Now, it is within this context that then Paul uses the word reconciliation five times in this, uh, in this passage. Reconciling, reconciliation. Five times. <coughs> and the, the, the Greek word that Paul uses, katalasso, or the dedicated terms of reconciliation, katalage, is surprising. It's, it's not a religious term at all. The term Paul uses is from a political legal setting that was very common in political and legal setting, which means an exchange of one thing for another. If, for example, within the domestic uh, context, husband and wife are having trouble and so forth, and they didn't agree, and they come to the court, 
uh, and the court then uh, intervenes, and then they kind of write and say, okay, let's forget about the past, let's now move on, and so forth. And a, a, a kind of exchange happens, exchange happens that signifies that we have moved on from the past, now we're going to move into a new dispensation. So the word that he uses, reconciliation, reconciling, uh, reconcile, the catalogo, is a kind of an exchange, a legal, formal exchange in which one thing is exchanged for another. The old for the new. Enmity for friendship. Broken relationships for restored relationships. It's kind of if you think about the story of creation and the disruption that happened in sin, chapter 3 of Genesis, what Paul is announcing here, that now that has been restored, uh, the equilibrium in a way has been uh, restored and God is done all that. <coughs> the other very important word is the word. God has been reconciling the word. It's not just a kind of a personal relationship that is, is restored, but it's the whole word. The word of animals, of plants, of human beings, of angels, as he says in the letter of the Christian, is he concerned all things, everything. The, the, everything is renewed, restored. The new creation means total cosmic everything. Even though Paul does not use the word in this particular text, what he has in mind is the kind of shalom, the Old Testament notion of shalom, where the well-being of the individuals, the inner well-being of the individuals, the outer well-being of the individuals, the relationship with neighbors, the relationship with God, the relationship with society, with the land, that everything has been restored, that has been broken, but now has been restored. The vertical, the horizontal, and everything. Uh, and finally, there is this word in Christ that comes up three times, through Christ, in Christ, with Christ, that Paul uh, brings up. This is very, very Pauline. Paul uses this term so often in his writings, in Christ, over 160 times in the whole of his writings. He, he likes the word in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, and crossed. It, it, it's so uh, central to Paul's theology that people, uh, scholars call it, this is the unifying motif in Paul's writing in Christ. Uh, but what does it mean that Paul would do again within this small passage, short passage, bring this up three times in Christ? What Paul is saying that God has been reconciling the world, if this has been going on, an ongoing way, in Christ, it has finally been realized. In Christ, it has come to completion, to fulfillment. That it is the Christ event that is now the decisive event within that movement of reconciliation in Christ. But also it means that now in Christ, you can see it. You can see what that means. That's why for Paul, in not only here in Corinthians, but in other letters, he goes on to kind of to say what, what this means. Uh, the, be the most beautiful passage is Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20, where uh, Paul goes on like this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or dominions or authorities, all things have been created through him, through him again, and in him, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, now you hear that reverberation of in him, through him, with him, and you hear that how Paul ties it together with 
He has reconciled all things, everything, making new what has, has been broken. Short passage. Reconciliation comes up five times, but kind of providing the whole summary of what Paul proclamation of the gospel is. And in fact, the way he states it here is not even a, de a description. It is a proclamation. It is uh, an announcement. Anyone in Christ, new creation. And this is what has been going on. God has been reconciling the world. So reconciliation is a kind of that process through which God has been doing this in the world. Okay. Uh, a lot can be said, but uh, let's stop that. So if this is what has been going on, then the question is, how then should we live? If this is, if we live in the dispensation of new creation, what does that mean for our lives concretely uh, here uh, on earth? Three things, three images of how then shall we live. Three images. One, gift. Two, ambassador. Three, journey. Three very, very powerful images for Paul. One is gift. The gift of reconciliation. Anyone of Christ, new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. And all this is from God. So the first uh, implication for us regards the discipline of gratitude. All this is from God. It has been given. It has been reconciled. It, it, it has been realized. The reconciliation has already been realized. I say, reconciliation has been realized? New creation? Uh, I don't feel like new creation today. Do you? <laughs> Just have the word, for example, the, the news about more terrorist bombings in, in Kenya, the abduction of how many girls in Nigeria, the enmities and the undersea uh, political rankling in, in Washington, D.C. Does that sound like new creation to you? The personal brokenness that you're feeling, that we feel, the sickness in our families, in our bondages, and so forth. Oh, not to say anything about uh, uh, the tensions or disagreements and the bickering in the parishes. Does that sound like new creation? <laughs> so how does that, so the discipline of gratitude, when actually we are living in a world of brokenness, of sin, a personal brokenness and sin, social brokenness, it doesn't feel like that. So how can we even maintain that discipline of gratitude in the face of all that? For Paul, the question is about actually seeing. It's about how do we see the world. You can see the world as completely broken. And they've completed the world as kind of all left to itself. What Paul is inviting people into is that we have to put on a new lens. That is why in this passage, here we picked it up from verse 17. But in the verse before that, verse 16, Paul says, From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once did. We regard no one from a human point of view. We look at no one from a human point. Let us not look at the world from a human point of view. From now on, and that's why he immediately says, Anyone in Christ, new creation. We look at the world not from a human point of view. You've got to put on new lenses. So the discipline of gratitude has to do with also the gift of a new lens. How do we see the world? It means, given this passage, given this announcement, it means that with all the personal sicknesses, brokenness, sins, injustices, racism, violence, terrorism in the world, with all that going on, the world is still God's theater of operation. And what is God doing in the world? God has been reconciling the world to himself. In fact, the news here, God has already reconciled the world to himself. The world is already healed the word is already restored in spite of all that is going on. That, that is the first gift, the gift of discipline, that in all our everyday life activities, in spite of all that is going on, to get lenses to see that actually God's 
ongoing work of healing, of restoration, of renewing is going on. And it's being realized in spite of all that. It does take, in a way, a discipline. That's why I call it the discipline of, of gratitude. It does take a discipline because on a given day, day to day, we don't feel like we live in a world of, of new creation. Oops. Did it again. Well, the second, the, 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 the second image, how then shall we live? Then Paul, uh, towards the end of the passage, says, go. oh, okay, good, thanks. Ambassador, then towards the end of the passage says, God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Actually, he uses the word diakonia, the service of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors in the world. This passage, the, one, the second implication means that we live as ambassadors. The invitation is how do we Christians see our life in the world as a kind of diplomatic posting, ambassadors. The word that Paul uses, presibios, presibio, ambassadors, which were in Paul's time, editary, statesmen, that were appointed by the king as delegates, legates in different towns to represent uh, the king. That's, that, that's what Paul uses. Again, another very political uh, term that Paul uses, ambassadors, legates to kind of see uh, our posting in the world as, as, as ambassadors. This, this is quite another powerful image, if you think about it. The image of an ambassador. As they are posted around the world, they live in those places that are not home, actually, but they get kind of to settle in a little bit. Uh, they enjoy the food, the traditions, the cultures. They learn about the, the histories of those countries where they are posted, and um, they get friendship and so forth. But uh, somebody reminded me that ambassadors, I was appointed for five term, for five years, usually no more than five years, lest they settle in too much. And then they are posted to a new place. Why? Because it's a kind of reminder. Where well, you might enjoy where you're, what you are doing, the, the friendship that you are making in this country and so forth, but do not forget where you come from. Do not forget your primary loyalties. Your primary loyalties are to a completely different uh, kingdom. So the U.S. ambassador, for example, to Uganda, even, he, even as he enjoys a, a lot of different Ugandan aspects and so forth, he's constantly thinking about the policies and the politics of, of, of the U.S. So two things, I think, in terms of this image of ambassador. One, in terms of what is the primary loyalty? What is the primary dominion in which I represent here in this particular town, in this particular parish, in this particular country. The second thing is about, when you think about the life of an ambassador, is that constant negotiation? Uh, sorry, Tim. <laughs> is that con constant negotiation of the back and forth between one whose native country and the place where they are assigned, where they are appointed? A kind of moving back and forth, negotiating, uh, the day-to-day -day politics, in a way. Uh, that's a term that I want to, to lift up here. The life of an ambassador is so much about negotiation, negotiating everyday challenges, everyday activities. But everyday activities and challenges in connection with uh, the primary identity of, 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 of the ambassador's uh, uh, home country. So as kind of living as, as resident aliens. The third is the sense of journey. And, and here I'm going to be uh, uh, pretty fast. I'm not going to spend a, whole, a lot of time. But the sense like the, the text that Paul uses, he said God was reconciling. Already kind of shows that ongoing aspect in journey, in sense of journey. Even for God, reconciliation is a journey. It's a process, an ongoing. And so to be invited to be ambassador is kind of to be invited into that journey of in between, really. Reconciliation is here. All this is from God. But Paul also knows that it is not yet here. The whole creation is groaning, is anticipating, is waiting for the final revelation of God's children. So it's kind of really locating in that kind of in between, between, yes, gratitude, reconciliation is given, is here, but also anticipation, 
and the struggle toward a new a new creation that kind of sense of ongoing journey and uh, what i do identify uh, five gifts for the journey that are needed if one has to live within that journey uh, with what i call feet on the ground and eyes on the, in the cloud you, those those two have to be kept together feet on the ground the posting whatever one is learning the intricate politics details of history of culture whatever one is but also eyes in the clouds remembering so the first gift discipline is memory remembering remembering what remembering new creation what does that mean remembering new creation remembering what the journey is all about from creation to new creation and this is the whole biblical story from creation for promise exile fall again redemption in peaceful ways the prophets and then in christ and then the church moving on towards the the parousia that kind of memory to constantly remember that that gives that kind of sense of the journey of, of reconciliation if one forgets that sense of the journey of where it is headed the two things can happen whether we live in the world and thinking, oh, this is it. This, it can ne never get, get better than this. But that, what that means actually, we get settled to the economy class and say, oh, this is it. There, there, there's nothing more than this. This, this, is, this is our life here. We need to remember and therefore have invitations and opportunities now and again to move into the business class and kind of see clearly what gifts they are. And we shall come back to, to our discussion. But I think worship does that very well kind of takes us out of the economic class, transports us into the business class so that we can see very clearly, and then transports us back into the actual life so that we can struggle, but live within that with a new lens, with a new energy, with a new uh, opportunities to kind of recreate what we already see. So memory. The second, the second gift is lament. Lament is a key gift. Lament is about learning to see, to name, to stand within brokenness without despair. Because when we're sick or when we're broken, when we're foreign, when we live within the world of terrorism and so forth, we can very easily despair and say, this is all there is. Lament gives us the ability to learn to stand within that brokenness and yet at the same time see that no, this is not all there is, but God is creating, recreating, renewing, restoring, reconciling that lament is about the whole creation is groaning to stand within that groaning and standing within that groaning is actually standing within the same groaning of god it is god himself who is groaning so that kind of uh, anguish the anguish of god the third is hope hope is what helps keep lament from actually turning into despair hope and lament go hand in hand Hope is what helps us to see that even in the midst of all the brokenness, God is always planting seeds, small signs of hope, as he says in Isaiah. See, I'm doing a new thing. Can you perceive it? Can you see it? That hope is a discipline. Hope is about seeing those signs that are always there, that God is planting, even in the midst of the most horrible uh, situations or, or of the world but also hope is about looking around and seeing that oh my goodness we are not alone we are actually sur surrounded by what the letter of the hebrews called a cloud of witnesses people who have gone before us but also people who are living in our midst who have in a way engaged this journey in such an extraordinary way that they can inspire us kind of invite us to yeah we can make it the saints uh abraham sarah the Martin Luther King Juniors of the Dorothy days, all these crowd of saints and crowd of witnesses that kind of keep our energy and struggle invigorated. Then advocacy. Augustine says it very well. Hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and the courage to do something about that. They go hand in hand. The life of an ambassador is a life of advocacy. How can we improve this situation here? How can we bring that dimension of new creation, 
within this broken community, within our parish, within the family. It's a kind of looking for opportunities to improvise spaces, opportunities, signs of how that new creation uh, comes to be concretely fed and realized. And finally, intimacy. The kind of reconciliation is about peace in the world, it's about ending war, it's about ending poverty, it's about all these big pictures, but it's also a very deeply personal journey. It is about our invitation to stand within that new creation, our lives, our lives that are broken, our lives that are sinful. How do we, in a way, even with our sinful lives, celebrate that new creation? This is the intimacy with God. It's about that intimacy with God. It's about deepening our life in, in, in God. It's, but also it's about, in a way, connecting with that anguish of God who, for the sake of the hope that lay in the future, was able to endure the cross. The journey of reconciliation is painful. It's so much filled with pain and anguish. How, how, how does one even sustain it uh, outside that uh, in, in, in a way, intimacy. Therefore, moments of prayer, moments of silence, moments of devotion, worship, all kind of builds up that intimacy with God to engage uh, the journey of reconciliation. Finally, by way of conclusion, uh, so where does this leave us in terms of worship and liturgy? One image that I have, given this picture, is how do we think about worship and image as both formation and fueling station? Formation and fueling station. In the third Eucharistic prayer, we pray, may this sacrament of our reconciliation, O Lord, advance the peace and unity of the world. The Mass as the sacrament of reconciliation. Sacrament is both a sign but also reality of reconciliation. So if you think about it in terms of school of formation, for example, the, the sacrament of reconciliation, the mass, in a way invites us to be schooled, to form us into what that journey is about. And how does it do that, for example? First of all, begin reading the word of God. Memory is shaped. Okay, this is how it has been. From the beginning, God has been reconciling creation, the prophets, and so forth. It's almost kind of providing us with a lens that this is how we should re read scripture as that kind of journey. And we do that during Mass. Memory is shaped through the Eucharistic prayers on the night before he died. Okay, this is what in Christ means. That's what when, was realized. And so the, the, the whole worship you know, kind of provides that uh, formation, but also makes it real. Uh, similar to the invitation, my invitation to the business club, it's not just kind of fanciful, it is real. You, you've got to really experience what that feels like, what that looks like, what that is really. So that worship liturgy is not just an anticipation of the real life that takes place out there. It is the life. It, Eucharist is the very drama in which God is doing that. So making it that very, very real in terms of its dynamics. But it is for this reason as well that the worship, especially the mass, the way the mass is set up, it keeps, keeps us on a journey moving back and forth between the past, the stories of scripture, whether it is Moses or Abraham or God, the prophets, but also all the future, pointing towards the future. Romans, groaning, the whole creation is groaning. But where is that headed? And then when you get a passage, for example, from the book of Revelation, towards the end of the book of Revelation, then said, then I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down. Oh, you realize, okay, that is what this journey is about. So, in a way, within worship, within mass, you go back, you move forward. You move back and forth between what God has done and what yet to be realized. Moving back between remembrance, memory, on the night he was betrayed, you remember all those things that happened, but also anticipation, or claiming the mystery of faith, until he comes again. For until he comes again, now we stand in this kind of in-between, and uh, 
the wife, life of in between, life of an ambassador, ad advocacy, and also intimacy. Also, th all these elements within worship, in a way, they are recreated, but they also they are made real so that we are formed into what this actually means. Again, moving back and forth between praise, doxology, through him, in him. Do you hear Paul? The word has been restored, doxology, praise, but also lament. I stand as broken sinners. I confess my sin. Yeah, so it's so kind of moving back. This provides a school of formation. It kind of forms us into what this new creation is and how to engage that journey. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, uh, worship, and we can have more conversation about what I like also about worship, especially the mass, is in the way that it is able to hold it together these two dimensions of lament and hope. Lament and hope go hand in hand. To live as hopeful people, we also need to learn to live through the discipline of lament. And the mass concreted discipline of lament is only at the beginning. Let us take a moment of silence to remember our lives, where we have been our brokenness and sinfulness and confess our sins a truth of naming what is wrong not only with us let us not just confess my sins our sins let us confess also the sins of the world the terrorism the injustice the poverty the hunger that is out there the brokenness of creation is out there all that we need to name within that sacrament of of penance within that confiteo within that announcement within that um, uh, reconciliation but immediately we do that we sit down to listen to the word of God and then we are invited to the table and then we remember the night before he suffered Jesus sitting down with the people who are to betray him and that is us <laughs> we are invited to sit at the table even though we are sinners so that the participation in the Eucharist is already given he does not just say, okay, if you are clean, if you are uh, without sin, only you come. No, no, it's already given. They remember that on the night he was betrayed, he sat down with the people that were to betray him. He invites the sinners to eat with him, and, and that's us. And so that is what actually allows us to stand in that uh, in between of lament and hope of the past and the future of what has already been realized. New creation is here of what is yet to come, anticipating uh, the final uh, par par parousia. And finally, the element of fueling station. The mass the worship as a kind of fueling station, getting energy, getting fed for the journey, kind of drawing new uh, energy, but also kind of deepening, deepening that journey from a personal point of view. That's why I want to end with the story of uh, of this uh, archbishop from northern Uganda. I think he helps to kind of bring together all these different elements that we've been talking about, new creation, the journey, ambassadors, the gift, the different uh, aspects of worship. Archbishop John Baptist Odama uh, became uh, archbishop of Gulu at a very, very difficult time in northern Uganda when, and I think many of you have heard of the story of the Lord's Resistance Army, Connie 2012, the invisible children, uh, made that, that now. But at, at the heart of the, that story is Archbishop Odama. A lot of abduction of children, uh, the war going on, devastated the families and the homes. Archbishop Odama becomes Archbishop and he's done quite a lot. He did quite a lot. Uh, traveling to the bushes to meet Joseph Connie and tell him to stop the fighting, then coming to the government, telling uh, the President Museven to reconcile with, the, with, with, the, with the, the rebels, to sit down with the rebels, to negotiate, and of course being suspected by, by, by both sides, but kind of moving back and forth and doing that ministry of advocacy. And then at the height of the war, many of the children were uh, leaving home and sleeping on the streets because they feared for their lives and they, that they would be abducted. So in the middle of the night, Archbishop Odama himself uh, one week goes and sleeps with the children on the streets 
and says it's not right that me as an archbishop should be sleeping in, a, uh, in my residence when all of you are sleeping out. And so he sleeps for a week with the children on the street. And of course, that's what drew media attention, actually, to the plight in northern Uganda. And one, one, one afternoon in the midst of that one evening, he kneels down before the children to ask for the forgiveness because of we who the leaders, the institutions have done to betray you. It is God's vision that each one of you should live in peace, in a new creation. But because of our selfishness, of our greed, and so forth, see what has happened. So he kneels down to ask for forgiveness from, uh, from, 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 from the children. So he's going on endless ministry activities and so forth. What keeps Odama going? He was asked this question one time at one of our meetings. What keeps you going? And he says, what keeps me going is Thursday. Thursday? What's Thursday? <laughs> so he says, on Thursday, I don't do any work. There are people always coming to his office, but on Thursday, I don't see anybody. I don't do any work. Wake up in the morning, 6 o'clock, uh, go for mass, um, do exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, spend the whole day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Whole day, fasting and praying, says, yes, what do you, what do, you do? So, uh, <laughs> what, what do you do the whole day in front of the Blessed Sacrament? He says, well, I pray, I pray to God, but also I, I name before God. I name before God what is going on. What is going on in northern Uganda, what's going on around us, but also what is going on within me. I'm tired. I don't have more energy. But I'm also sinful. I also name what is going on around and also uh, bring to, before God, the faces of the different people, of the different children, of people that are in just kind of bringing, 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 bringing before God. You almost feel the sense of an ambassador kind of reporting back, writing kind of reports back to, to Bess. <laughs> so I, 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 I do that the whole day. And one of my students said, but that, that doesn't take a whole day. So for the rest of the day, what do you do? He said, well, I see it, I look at him, and he looks at me. <laughs> at times I doze off and, <laughs> and then wake up, he's still there, I look at him and so forth and so on and so on. And I, I feel as I'm doing this, I'm more drawn into what it means to live into this journey. What it means to live into this dispensation. Because I know God has already reconciled the world. God has already redeemed the world. The gift has already been given. But God, from where we are standing, it is all groaning. It is all pain. It's all suffering. The anguish. And then uh, Archbishop Adama says, but then I realize that, you know, at times I take myself too seriously. These are not my children. These are not my people. These are not even Connie's people. These are not Museveni's people. These are God's people. So if I'm feeling the anguish as I'm feeling, how much more is God feeling that anguish? So then I begin to realize that my anguish, in a way, Pairs in comparison of that. So I, all I can do is to join my anguish with the anguish of, of, of God. And then out of that, at times I get very specific uh, instructions, he says. At times I get very specific insights of what I need to do. And so the following day on Friday, it's back to business. Back to, <coughs> oh, back to business. I think that's a, a wrong image. It's not back to business. Because Thursday is the business. <laughs> Thursday is the business. So the, 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 the Friday is another form of engagement. Again, improvising signs of hope, standing in lament, but also constantly remembering where this journey is coming, uh, coming from, but being drawn deeper and deeper into uh, the gift of, of new creation. So this is a kind of dynamic in a way which the liturgy not only reproduces, recreates, renews, but also makes us remember what it is that we are about in the world. We are about that story, that journey of new creation. Again, to uh, remember what uh, <coughs> Paul says about that. <coughs> Anyone Christ, new creation. The old is gone, the new is here, and all this is a gift. And God has been doing, reconciling the world to himself, and inviting us to be ambassadors, giving us the ministry 
the service, the akonia of reconciliation as God's ambassadors in the world. Such an exciting journey, but such a tremendous gift that we are all given. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. We have some time for questions or comments. Yes. You know, when you were speaking about experiencing uh, the reconciliation and all that, I was thinking that when know, uh, the Orthodox priest spoke. Uh, my mother was Greek, and I'm a biracial priest. But I think a lot of people don't understand the Orthodox. They see them there, very knowledgeable, or very exotic. Mm. They don't understand the, and the experience of it. And therefore, it's very difficult to be reconciled with the Orthodox, to experience what they, and vice versa. Uh, so it's so important to try to experience what other people, other churches and so on, experience it. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, 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 definitely. The question of experience is so important. But actually, the first thing that we talk about when we, in terms of reconciliation, as I said, in many evangelical uh, places, when we speak, they may just say, what are the skills in which we can become reconciliers? But there is no way that you can even become a reconciler, to be a reconciler, to be an ambassador. And you have experienced that tremendous fresh gift that Paul is talking about here. The sense of new creation as a whole. And uh, when you talk more specifically about the Orthodox, one thing I like about the Orthodox uh, worship liturgy, the Orthodox, uh, the, the, the worship the liturgy is it, in a way. It, it is not just a kind of a symbol, it's not just kind of a preparation, it is a kind of an invitation into, uh, the, so that it is that liturgy and worship in a way in which we really experience what it means to live within this dynamic of this story of God reconciling the world to himself, of being a new creation. And then the liturgy becomes, in a way, the lens of, of, of life. It becomes both formation, but also kind of provides a sense of, okay, life actually, should be modeled after worship. I, I think you get that from uh, the Orthodox experience more uh, than any other uh, Christian tradition, that, that sense of the significance and the, of, of, of worship as, as the invitation into that, that experience. I read somewhere where they were setting up a new mission in Africa. And uh, the first thing to do was not to keep well, the challenge, of course, on the other side is how not to kind of uh, lock ourselves up within the liturgy and worship and just kind of lose sense of the, that back and forth, yeah. that back and forth movement, that it kind of brings us into the business class lounge. Mm -hmm. Then we can see clearly what it is actually, but at the same time kind of moves us back from the mountain to the valley, from the past into the future, into the now. It's kind of that, that I, I, I guess you get a sense of the constant movement within the liturgy, the, that journey within the liturgy, the movement within the liturgy is the movement of new creation itself, as it moves back between the past, the future, the gratitude, the lament, the doxology, the praise, and then of course the, the groaning. It, it is the map for life. I just have a comment about uh, the gifts for the church. Just I appreciated this uh, aspect of uh, lament and despair. I have always kind of seen them as one and the same. And, and yet, you talk about lament actually being standing in the midst of it without despair. And that hope is what feeds that from, from diving into despair. And I thought that was a uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I think the question of lament is something that we need to rediscover more and more and become more uh, articulate about because it is what actually allows us to stand in the sluggish now. 
without giving in to despair. It's kind of holding on to. Lament is Desmond Tutu in South Africa at the gravesite of one of the anti-apartheid uh, activists. Lament, uh, Tutu speaking, Lord, we know that your victory is assured, but why must the cost be so high? Lament is Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It looks like a, a prayer of desperation, of, but it's still my God. It's a kind of a hanging on to my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Lament is a woman in, that I, I, I know in Burundi, whose village was killed, 72 people killed in front of her. And then out of that, she kind of emerged with very clear determination to build a new future. And so she brings together children to raise them up in a new identity, neither Tusi or Tusi, but as children of God. But every day, she keeps going back to the gravesite where those people are buried. I asked her, why do you keep going back? And she said, it's not to relieve the pain, but to see clearly the future. Standing in lament is what allows us actually to come to a sense of enough is enough. It, it, it's a sense of uh, energy that arises out of that. But only to the extent that we are able to connect our anguish with the anguish of God himself. Lament is that movement in which God says, my people, my people, how long? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how long have I longed to gather you? But, but he not, never gives up in a way. So lament is all, all that does that. And the more you think about it, the more you realize that lament is just a kind of a flip side of hope. Lament and hope go hand in hand. To the extent that we don't know how to name brokenness and sinfulness and stand within that, <coughs> we kind of easily cover up. And therefore, we stand the indictment of Jeremiah. Woe to you who say, peace, peace to my people, when there's no peace. So we, we kind of heal lightly the wounds of the world. Lament is what allows us to recognize that we are sinners, to name our truth, uh, in truth, our sinfulness, <coughs> that we are broken, <coughs> and yet not to despair. Why? Because we know that we are also already forgiven. Because we know that on the night he died, he sat with sinners. And that's us. That we are invited as, for, as sinners to the Lord's table. That, of course, now for many of our uh, requirements, or it's only those who have fully confessed their sins and so forth and so on, who are invited there. But the bigger picture is actually much more complex and interesting. Judas never confessed his sins when he sat at the table with the Lord, and the Lord passed on the bread to Judas. That is us. That even after sitting at the Lord's table, we're going to betray him. To, to name that and say that is the truth of our lives in a way. But, but we live in hope because we know that this new creation is already going on. That God is actually healing even when we don't fear it. That it's lament in a way that kind of, if you like, provides the glue with all these different disciplines. As we remember, of course, what has gone on but also as we participate and live in hope. But God is also providing the energy for more advocacy of the new creation. Yes, sir. I lived for five years in Papua New Guinea, uh, doing some work in a seminary there. And <coughs> it brought home to me, seeing the way people solved their differences, it opened up for me all our Lord's teachings Gospels about forgiveness because of the habit, the, the payback. And um, the most striking example was the Archbishop of Port Moresby criticised the government for his corruption in his Easter message. And two years later, a member of the same religious community, a Franciscan priest, uh, had his head blown off by a shotgun in bed at night on the Feast of the Assumption. Um, so but the point being that this brought home to me the strength of our Lord's teaching and obviously the point you've been meditating on with us. Um, the 
but that's the normal way. That is the old creation. And without Christ, without grace, uh, we cover it up with insurances and compensation payments and incarceration. Uh, but we forget how radically we ourselves need this gift to bring us to creation. And it struck me very simply, the first uh, thing the Pope said in the new Pope Francis, and stop gossiping about each other in Rome. Uh, how much evil comes from this simple habit of all of us? And it's, uh, it's another issue. Yeah. yeah, no, I just say, I mean, I, you, 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 yeah, really just want to affirm that. But also, uh, it, it, what arises out of that is the realization that old habits die hard. That Paul announces, the old is gone, the new is here, you know, you're living a new dispensation, new creation. But how much of old patterns and habits that, that we live with? And I think that's where, in Romans, then he talks about that kind of groaning the whole creation. Because we are in, within a new creation, but also we are living within the old patterns and habits. And how then do we move from the old patterns is that constant journey. And yeah, I think you, you're exactly right about the old patterns kind of being persistent. And the immediate interpretation, I think, is kind of to give up and say, oh, this is just human nature. This is, yeah, we, 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 we are okay as we are. No, we are not okay. We, we are within our patterns. And God is moving us into the new creation. At times, of course, we, we, we are moving into the new creation, kind of kicking and, <laughs> and crying. But he, he does move us into the new creation. He does, in a way, transform our life. He does heal our life. But it's not only the gift, but also the effort that that takes on God's part as well as on our part. I think we're done. Thank you very much. And, uh, well, I think, uh, Father Emmanuel, though you said that you wanted to address the bigger issue to get to the smaller issue, I think you did even more than that. Um, precisely because I think in a real way, if what would happen if precisely this larger vision was given to people in our parishes, um, in, in our communities, about that we live in the new creation, wouldn't we come to see the wounds all the more real? Precisely because we saw the heights to which we're called. Mm. Uh, and that's such a gift, I think it's, it, I couldn't, ima I couldn't imagine, you know, sort of first penance, first reconciliation programs beginning with this gift first and foremost, rather than simply, you know, here's how to kneel in this, the confessional. Mm -hmm. What if we began with the gift? Um, what if we proclaim the gift? Well, then you would understand that you are sinful because you can see the, how much gift the gift is. So thank you. Mm. Thank you very much.